Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, this is the kind of delayed Constitution Day ceremony uh, program here, and it's uh, we've, we've been having these the last few years here. I want to make clear to begin with that it's uh, really Dr. Mason's uh, program. I'm just ended up with the guy that does some of the talking here, so uh, it's not. A, I, I don't deserve any credit here. It's uh, Dr. Mason is has always put this program together. Now, before we get started, uh, I've got a few thank yous to do, and, and then one recognition I uh, want to do. Uh, if I've got it on my hand, so I'll set. Uh, <coughs> uh, I'm set up there reading it yet. Uh, so, Nate Jones, could you stand up a minute? Okay, uh, Nate Jones last summer was our uh, Civic uh, Education Fellow and it went down and spent, how, how long were you down there, Nate? Two weeks. Two weeks uh, down in Oklahoma City. Uh, I think he was in charge of running the Oklahoma State Government for those two weeks. And so <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, he, it, was a, it was a great start and a great experience for him and I think we'll probably, I'm sure we'll be sending some, some others down in the, uh, in the future here. So anyway, Nate, proud of you. Okay, a <clears throat> uh, couple other thank yous. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Masonic uh, Charity Foundation of Oklahoma, their generosity in helping for the establishment of the NWOSU Masonic Institute for Citizenship Studies. Um, I think it's, it's a great start here and will provide for many more programs like this one uh, in the future. So uh, we really owe a, a, a real debt uh, to, the, uh, to the Masons uh, for being able to do this. Uh, the next thank you I've got here is for Dr. Mario Carvajal. Um, Dr. Carvajal uh, agreed to do this. He comes through this area once in a while. He's of course been on this campus a number of times and we usually can find some way to uh, exploit him and take advantage of him while, while he's here. So uh, it just happened he was coming through right around Constitution Day, so we decided, well, we're just putting to work here in Constitution Day. So he just, out of the goodness of his heart, uh, just keeps participating in things here at uh, NWOSU. So we certainly owe, owe uh, Dr. Kyle Hall a, a big debt of gratitude. Uh, Aaron, would you like to make a little presentation to him? Dr. Uh, Carter Hall, on behalf of the Institute, I'd like to present you with this t-shirt, this with this shirt, which uh, has one of our logos on it, has remained embossed as well. And I'd like to add that Dr. Carter Hall is also uh, considered to be a member of our review board, so he brings additional expertise to our review board. So it's only fitting that he should receive a share. Not only participating in the event, but also being a part of our review board. So I'd like to thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, now, uh, very quickly, I want to explain what our program is going to be today. What we're intending to do is have a comparison here between the uh, U.S. Constitution and the Costa Rican Constitution. Now, the comparative part is pretty easy because as near as I can calculate, I'd say at least 80% of the two constitutions are the same. Very similar, sometimes almost exact in wording. Uh, however, <clears throat> there are, there's the other maybe 15 to 20% uh, that are very different. Now, the purpose here is not a debate. What we're going to do is we want to take a look at these things and hopefully try to understand how these differences fit into the circumstances of two countries that physically are just totally different, but on the other hand, represent maybe the two most successful constitutional republics in the history of the world. So uh, it, it's interesting that they can have these differences and still, and still both be successful within their own environment. Now, just to kind of uh, give an idea to you of how different this is, okay. Uh, let's take uh, physical size of these two countries. 
Costa Rica would fit within the state of Oklahoma approximately two and a half times within the state of Oklahoma. So it's totally different in physical size. Despite that, Costa Rica has a population of around four and a half million to Oklahoma who has 3.4 million roughly. So it's got uh, more people into a significantly smaller area. <clears throat> In relation to uh, uh, gross national or gross domestic product, uh, the uh, Costa Rica has approximately 50, uh, 50 billion dollar gross domestic product compared to Oklahoma, who has about 140 billion dollar gross domestic product. To the, you know, compare it on to the United States, about 14 trillion dollars of gross domestic product for the United States. So once again, huge differences. Now, uh, <clears throat> a couple of other things. Of course, Costa Rica comes from, it was a Spanish colony, so it comes from a tradition of Spanish and Roman law, where the law is all written out, and then you, everything is included, and then you, there's no interpretation really left. Of it. In the case of the United States, we come from the tradition of English common law, so the laws are written, and then it's left to the court system to apply those laws uh, with fairness and equity. So different system. Now as a result of that, I thought I had a very good comparison here because the Costa Rican Constitution, I didn't count every word, but it's roughly 17,000 words. Uh, the US Constitution is about 4,500 words. So ours is much briefer, more brief, whatever, than uh, the Costa Rican Constitution. So I was going to make that comparison until I checked and realized that the Oklahoma Constitution is over 50,000 words. So that kind of ruined my comparison on that part. <clears throat> the, uh, the U.S. Constitution was established uh, after a war of independence, right after, uh, within a few years of when the United States became an independent nation. The Costa Rican Constitution was written in 1949 after a civil war that came about because one of the because the existing government was unwilling to turn control of the government over to the the uh, newly elected government. So a little brief civil war, and then this constitution was written and has been in effect ever since. <clears throat> now, with in the United States, our constitution uh, was written in an era in an era of enlightenment liberalism, just following the enlightenment. Uh, the Costa Rican Constitution was written in an era when social democracy was kind of the watchword in much of the world. So they're written under different circumstances. However, like I said, somewhere 80 to 85 percent of them are, the, are the same, they're just very, very similar. But what we're interested in today is taking a look at some of the differences and hopefully kind of understand why those differences, differences are there and why they have worked so well for both for both nations. So the way we are intending to do this <coughs> is uh, I will ask uh, Dr. Mason a question about what the U.S. Constitution, uh, how it deals with a particular thing, and then he can explain that, uh, hopefully both of you very briefly, and uh, then uh, we'll have Dr. Carvajal explain how the Costa Rican Constitution deals with it in a different way and rule why the Costa Rican Constitution does things in that, in that manner. I really think, I've always believed, that you do not really understand your own system of government, your own society, your own economy, or whatever, until you have had occasion to learn about somebody else's. So I think the real aim here is for all of us to have a better understanding of our own system of government through understanding the differences here with the Costa Rican Constitution. So anyway, uh, with that, I guess we will put uh, Dr. Mason on the spot here and ask about how the U.S. Constitution deals with the uh, creating a federal system, a system of federalism in government. Well, of course, in Article One, sets up a lot of that. Uh, well, excuse me, the federal system, you go back to Article 4, actually. Uh, and 
to make it a brief answer, I, I think you, I don't think you can possibly envision the Constitution without strong state governments. Um, and of course, the state governments have to subordinate a degree of their sovereignty to the federal government, and they of course do that uh, in Article One by giving up things like treaty-making power and the right to enter into confederations and things like that. But Article Four really sets up that relationship. To a great extent, but with things like the full faith and credit clause uh, and requiring states to give full faith and credit to each other. Uh, uh, Article 4 deals with a lot of that. But again, I, <clears throat> when you talk about a federal system, I think that's one of the things that distinguishes the United States from a lot of other governments is the sense that we have a, a federal system in which, as I always tell my classes, not only does the federal government influence the states, but the states also influence the federal government. It's a two-way relationship. And in many of the federal uh, arrangements you have, essentially the federal government always dictated to the states. And our Constitution does not permit that. The states have real powers. And certainly under, under the Ninth Amendment, the people retain certain powers. Under the Tenth Amendment, the state governments retain significant powers. Okay, Dr. Trumbull Hall, can you tell us about the most recent uh, system of government in relation to centralism versus federalism. Yes, uh, thank you. First of all, I would like to say hello to all of you. Thank, thank you for being here in this uh, Constitution Day. And uh, to tell you that for me, it's a real pleasure to be back in, in, in Alvaro. <coughs> in in WSU, after about a year and a half, we talked together, JW and I, in a seminar for Austin. Uh, actually, in our constitution, the, the Costa Rican government is a republic centralized with three powers, uh, the executive power, the legislative power, and the judicial power. The main difference that uh, we have is that we have actually a fourth power, that it's it's not called fourth power, but nevertheless, it, in, it, it is in the same article that establishes the uh, three other powers. That is called the Electoral National Tribunal. That actually, it's a body that is in charge of handling all elections in Costa Rica since the Constitution of 1949. And it, this was established mainly because we had cases of, of electoral fraud in the the 30s and 40s, which were the main reason for the Costa Rican Revolution of 1948. Okay, Dr. Mason, <clears throat> does the U.S. Constitution say anything about languages, about official languages? Uh, no, no mention of languages. Again, referring to that uh, brevity that you mentioned, uh, the Constitution, and that's a good segue into your last question because the brevity of the U.S. Constitution is meant to be taken up by the verbose language of the state constitutions, which tend to address issues like official languages. And, like the Oklahoma Constitution requires that uh, uh, primary instruction in the common schools of Oklahoma is in English, which dates back to 1907. So those, those types of things are omitted in the U.S. and taken up in the state constitution. So, Dr. Carnival Hall, how about the Costa Rican Constitution? Yes, Ar Article 76 of uh, the Costa Rican Constitution establishes that Spanish is the official language of, of the Republic. And actually, until very recently, it's been the only language, uh, actually, that, that is required in, in, in schools and, and high schools. Lately, we have uh, done a, a little work on conserving the languages of, of some of our Indian tribes. But uh, the Spanish is the official language. And it has to do with uh, that Spain was uh, the colonial power that uh, conquered uh, most of uh, Latin America, including Costa Rica. OK, uh, Dr. Mason, what does the US Constitution have to say about the establishment of the military? Uh, of course, Article One gives Congress the authority to raise an army and a navy under the enumerated powers. Uh, and of course, the President under Article Two is, is 
designated as the commander in chief. Congress is given the right to declare war, and the states, are, of course, are allowed to maintain individual uh, state militias, which can be called into the service of the United States at the request of the president. Hey, Dr. Cottle, how what does the Costa Rican Constitution say about the establishment of the military? Yeah, the Costa Rican Constitution abolished the army and abolished all, all, all kind of uh, armed forces in 1949. So actually, we've been for many years the sole country in, in the world to have no army. Uh, the, the other good thing is that we have, since 1949, devoted uh, the money that would have been into armed forces to education and health. Okay, next thing I have here has to do with uh, the establishment of religion in regards to the U.S. Constitution. It's a very difficult question, I understand. Always a fun topic to broach, yes. yeah. Uh, the, the, the Constitution, of course, as you said, comes out of the Enlightenment, the U.S. Constitution, and then an era of Enlightened uh, liberalism, and uh, most of the founders, of course, detested the idea of a state church. In its purest form, and the simplest, simplest way to answer is the Constitution prohibits the federal government from passing any laws that deal with the establishment of religion. A purest view of the Constitution would permit state governments a certain degree or latitude of legislating religious issues. But, of course, the doctrine of incorporation, which requires interpreting the 14th Amendment to apply to the states, which means that no state can treat citizens differently on the basis of any arbitrary basis like religion would also therefore prohibit the states from dealing in religion. But there is, of course, no uh, phrase separation of church and state in the Constitution. That, of course, emanates from a letter that Thomas Jefferson writes to the Danbury Baptist Association in which he essentially says that Congress will not legislate religion. It makes no mention of the state legislatures. But it is a matter that civil libertarians continue to debate. But, but of course, that's how states do have a certain degree of and flexibility in, in relating or regulating some issues of religion, whereas the federal does not. Okay, how about Costa Rica? In our constitution, religion is established as the, the Roman Catholic religion is the official state religion. And the government con contributes directly to its uh, maintenance. Nevertheless, the constitution also establishes that the government the government may not prevent the free exercise in the republic of other forms of worship that are not opposed to universal morality or good customs. So we have free uh, religion, but uh, we still have the, the, the state giving some assistance to the Catholic uh, Church. Uh, there's been a discussion, especially in the last uh, five years, to see if this article of the Constitution may, may be modified. But uh, the, the ones of us that believe that we shouldn't have a religion in the Constitution have not been a majority as of yet. <clears throat> okay, in regards to education, public education, uh, what does the U.S. Constitution indicate about that? Not easy questions, I think. You, you really are, you got it in for me today, don't you? Yeah. Uh, oh, give me some softballs here, okay. Uh, again, a matter of debate. Uh, a purist who approached the Constitution would argue that that's significantly a reserve power which would fall under the 10th Amendment and therefore be the prerogative of the states. Uh, I think there are some notable exceptions to that, though, and I think some legitimate arguments for federal involvement to certain extents. Uh, for example, uh, with, uh, with the issue of Indian affairs. Uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs schools, which are responsible for educating Indian children, uh, that would be a federal responsibility to one extent or the other. So you can argue also that it could be a concurrent power. But in the U.S., historically, uh, it has been the states which have provided for education, K through 12, as well as, well as universities. I, for example, in the first state constitution of uh, Massachusetts post-revolution, 1780, which actually is the oldest constitution, it actually predates the U.S. Constitution, the Massachusetts State Constitution of 1780. Uh, John Adams, uh, it's the oldest functioning one, John Adams actually wanted in the State Constitution a provision which would 
a create mandatory public education for all children. Uh, I believe up to, I have to check, I think it's like 11 years old or something like that. And, uh, something to that extent. So early on, we see this at the state level, so that the states have usually assumed themselves. Okay, Costa Rica has a reputation on the world for its public education and literacy and so on. So what does the Constitution in Costa Rica say about education? Very specifically, the, the, the Constitution of Costa Rica has several articles, I would say probably more than 10, uh, dealing with public education. It establishes that, that public education is a function of the government and must be provided for as the first, as first priority. It establishes, likewise, that freedom of teaching is absolute at all levels of, of education. Uh, it establishes, furthermore, that uh, at least 6% of our uh, growth in domestic product G GDP has to be devoted to the public education system of primary and secondary schools. And uh, more recently, about 20 years ago, it was established that public funding of public universities is also an obligation of the central government. Uh, and, and it has established for the public funding of public universities a system in which a university fund for the, the budgets of the public universities has to be established and negotiated between the executive branch and the public universities every five years. And that there is a disagreement between the universities and the central government, the legislative assembly decides. So all funding and decisions in regards to public education come from the national government. The national government. Whereas in the U.S., the state governments have, the local, not just state, but local governments have a huge in, uh, input in the education and the funding. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the next thing here is the, uh, the matter of the right to vote for suffrage if you will. So uh, what does the U.S. Constitution say about the right to vote? Yeah, that's, that's one that does find a precedent in terms of uh, amendments to the Constitution. But I'm going to say this off the top of my head. I would assume that we probably have more amendments relating to that specific issue. Uh, I've never thought about that than any other, uh, I'm guessing, any other specific that you could include the 15th, uh, the, the 19th, uh, the 26th, also, the 24th was bills of poll taxes. Uh, so you've got a significant issue there. Again, I would also say this goes back to this constant tension in American history between the forces of centralism and nationalism versus decentralized government. And uh, there certainly are episodes in our history where people have hidden behind the, the guise of state control and used that to prohibit people from voting, be it on the basis of sex or race or whatever, but our federal constitution has attempted to ameliorate that tendency on the part of the states and of course now we have universal suffrage uh, for people who are 18 years old and citizens. However, the states still retain the rights to uh, enforce their own registration systems which vary state by state. In states like Minnesota where you have same day registration, you can register the day of the election. In other states, you may have to register 90 days prior to, or 60 days, or 30 days prior to. So the states still retain that right to establish uh, their own registration systems. They also, the states also determine, in terms of elections, the physical appearance of ballots, of what candidates come first, and second, and third, and how the ballot appears. So there, are, there still are still significant rights that the states retain in that regard, although the federal government has provided a more specific right to vote under the, through the amendment process. And for the individual, the right to vote is a privilege. Correct. Stage, right? Correct. And, and that's a good point. And it is a privilege. It is a civil right. I, I make the distinction that it's a civil right, not a civil liberty. A civil liberty like freedom of speech, which can't really be curtailed in the same way that the right to vote can, or the right to own a firearm. Those are civil rights which are defined by statute and based upon one's behavior, they can be removed. They're not an absolute right. And again, 
the right to participate in that regard is maintained by the state governments. Okay, Dr. Kappa, how, how about the Costa Rica? Because I think there are parts I don't fully understand in regards to Costa Rica. Enlighten me. Yeah, the, the Constitution in Costa Rica establishes that uh, vote is an obligation of the citizen. And it establishes in the Constitution that, that we have compulsory suffrage. Uh, nevertheless, there is no sanction for not voting. So in that sense, we have the obligation, which is a moral obligation. But if, if a, a person doesn't vote, uh, there is no sanction. As usual, uh, since the 1950s that we began uh, <coughs> having elections in which we have a national identity card to, to go to vote, and then the, and the National Electoral Institute has established a list of all the voters in Costa Rica, which uh, all Costa Ricans practically have this, uh, this national identity card. From the 50s to the late 70s, um, abstentionism was about 20% in national elections. And uh, recently, this, it has grown a little bit more, mainly because voter dissatisfaction and today is about 30 percent. In the last three elections, it's, it's grown to 30 percent. But uh, participation in, in national elections is, is really high for international standards. Uh, before you finish, can I throw in a couple more questions? Uh, first, we've got a novelty. Uh, when I lived in Costa Rica, um, election day, when people voted, they stuck their thumb in, in indelible ink so that it would show them that they voted and they can't do it again. Can they still do that? No, that, that has been eliminated, I think, uh, for the last maybe 10 years. But it, <laughs> we, were, we were... I thought it was pretty effective, yes. really. <laughs> we, we were usually proud to, to show the week after election day that we had our, yeah. our index finger. Uh, and there was, off, the day. there was often a lot of social pressure if people didn't have uh, their, uh, their finger, their thumb, or whatever with the black ink on it. There was a lot of social pressure against them because they hadn't lived up to their obligation to vote. So the, the other thing is I've I, I, I known of discussions in the US and in some European countries of not, of, about the possibility of establishing identity cards as a obligation for the citizens in, in Costa Rica. This is, a, this is my identity card. Uh, actually, it has, it has a picture. It has your signature, and it has the date of, of birth. Uh, and, and lately, it has some other information, like uh, the type of blood. Do you use the identity card for anything other than voting? Yeah, if you don't have an identity card, you're, you're in a way, not a citizen because identity cards are required to do any, any, anything that you want to do at the public institution, you need to show your identity card. Uh, to get your children into school, you need to show your identity card. To cash a check in a bank, you need to show your identity card. To get a passport, you need to show the identity card. And to, and to get a license, a driver license, you need to show the identity card. Recently it happened to me that my wallet was stolen and I was supposed to come to the US and uh, so I, I lost my, my driver license. So I went to try to get a new driver license with my passport. And the person in the counter told me, listen, I'm sorry, for foreigners we accept the passport, but uh, you're in Costa Rica and you have to bring your identity <laughs> card, which had been stolen. Only citizens have the identity card? Citizens have this identity card, but also, also foreign residents have an identity card. And you are, are, you, the, are you legally required to carry it with you at all times, or just to show on certain occasions? Well, I don't know that you're legally required. I think not. You're not legally required to carry with you. But I would say Costa Ricans 
carry their identity card. Because in any case, if somebody wants to uh, ask for your identification, let's say the police, you will show them the identity card. If you don't have an identity card, they, they could probably detain you temporarily uh, if you're, let's say, a sus suspected of uh, having done a, a minor a misdemeanor or, or, or a crime. And when so I was a resident of I was required to carry an identity card as a resident of I was really? supposed to have it with me at all times. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because that's what they told me. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, uh, Dr. Mason, do you have anything to add to the question of, uh, of na a national or a state identity card, or do you really avoid the question? I will plead the fifth as an American citizen. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just take the fifth on that. Okay. Um, okay, Dr. Mason, um, in the uh, United States, as far as electing a president, uh, can you briefly tell how that works in the U.S.? Not briefly. Not briefly. No, and I have students Probably in the audience best. who can attest to that fact. And those of you that haven't had that, uh, Cody, you're going to get that pretty soon. So, okay. Uh, well, briefly, the, the Constitution is relatively brief when you read the text. And when you look at what it requires, it's, it's pretty complicated. But the Constitution essentially says that the states shall uh, select electors to select the president in a manner that their legislature shall direct. And with the exception of the 23rd Amendment, which provides the District of Columbia, which is not a state, and that's why it required a, a, a constitutional amendment to allow a non-state to be represented in the Electoral College. Uh, that's essentially how it works. It's that the states select electors in a manner directed by their legislature, and those uh, electors uh, select the president, of course, with the advent of Jacksonian democracy, uh, all the states eventually adopted methods by which popular election of the electors was achieved. And so we have indirect popular election of the President of the United States today. What, what happens if uh, nobody gets a majority? What, what, how does that work? Uh, then of course it goes to the House of Representatives and the House selects uh, by, by delegation vote. And we um, require a majority of the electors majority of the popular Correct. Uh, yes, uh, in the Electoral College, and then, as I call it, the contingency plan goes to the House. Correct. Right. Okay. Yeah, and, and we've seen that in recent times. Yeah. You can lose the popular vote and gain the Electoral vote, and I think that's, I think it's a fair criticism of the United States for people who don't understand our, our, our orientation, but again, the orientation is around the states. It's not around the popular vote. It was never intended to be around the popular vote. And until you modify the Constitution to reflect that reality, uh, people, people can be upset by that, but that, that's, the truth is the founders didn't found a democracy, they founded a republic, and uh, that's essentially what we have. So. so what about the Costa Rican Constitution in regards to electing the president? Uh, we, we have a 40% minimum vote to elect a, a candidate as president. So if, if there's, for if a candidate obtains more than 40% and, and it's the candidate that has the, the most votes, he's elected president. If there's, if there's no 40%, then we'll have a runoff election two months after. Uh, actually, elections in Costa Rica are always on Sundays. Uh, usually, it's in, on, on, on the first Sunday of February is the first election. The, if we have a runoff within the first Sunday of April, and uh, in that case, the, the, the runoff would, would be between the two candidates that had the most votes in the first election. If, if, however, there is a tie of the two candidates, which is very difficult, but any, anyway, uh, Something that is curious about the Costa Rican Constitution is that it establishes that the, the eldest of the, of the candidates would win. Yeah, I think that's a real curiosity. <laughs> you know, the, the chances, particularly when you are in a situation where you have the popular vote decided, yeah. the chances of having an absolute flat foot tie is almost none. And, but I think also the fact is the Costa Rican Constitution does create an end game. There, there is, has to be an end. 
the U.S. Constitution has tried over and over to deal with that and has never fully figured out how to make it work. So it, uh, but I think that's kind of interesting. The older candidate wins. <laughs> that's the old adage that old age and treachery will always overcome youth and skill. That's, yeah, I yeah. think that's it. <laughs> so uh, that's we'll, the let you, the we'll let you get away with that. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Okay, uh, this one I think is kind of a curiosity also. <clears throat> uh, let me ask uh, Dr. Conover Hall this first. The, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, the Costa Rican Constitution uh, provides uh, a uh, system by which the president has to get permission to leave the country. Uh, actually, I was looking on, on the day. Actually, the, the president of Costa Rica until 1997 could not leave the country if he didn't ask permission to the Legislative Assembly. And the Legislative Assembly had to uh, say yes. If, uh, if he didn't say yes, he couldn't go out of the country. Uh, in, in 1997, after certain events that I would like uh, JW to explain, uh, with a, a president that left the country without permission. The Constitution was reformed, and today it says that a, a president must inform the Legislative Assembly before uh, 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 he travels abroad, and must inform the, the reasons why he's leaving the country. But that was a, a change we made in the Constitution in 1997 after an event of, of of Don Pepe Figueres, which is one of the founders of, let's say, the new, the new uh, republic in Costa Rica, and uh, a promoter of the 1949 constitution. Yeah. Well, just very, I'll uh, explain it very briefly. Uh, uh, Don Pepe Figueres was, like I said, he was the most significant political figure in uh, Costa Rican history, really. And, uh, but he was also just a bit erratic, is that a fair enough word for <laughs> Don Pepe? He was uh, not even doing well, and but he, uh, he he tended to be work on impulse sometimes. Okay, uh, <clears throat> he got a an invitation to go to uh, Cape Kennedy to watch uh, one of the liftoffs for uh, something in the space program. I don't remember what it was. Happened that the uh, Costa Rica National Assembly wasn't meeting right then, so he just said, "Hey." I'm going, and he went and got on a plane and flew to Florida to watch it. Well, of course, when everybody discovered he'd left the country without permission, created a national crisis here, you know, broken all of the rules. And so when he got back, the press was there uh, waiting to, uh, to greet him and ask him about it. And uh, remember, well, he just kind of said, hey, what was I gonna do? They were in session. The rocket was getting ready to leave. I had to go. I had no <laughs> choice. <laughs> so, uh, it, uh, I remember that so well when that happened. Okay. Let's see. <clears throat> okay. Uh, with in regards to the legislative branch, <clears throat> how is the legislative branch set up in the U.S. by the U.S. Constitution? Well, Article One, of course, deals with the legislative branch. Uh, establishes bicameral legislature. Uh, and just to piggyback on the back of the, that comment there, it, it shows a great difference between the two in terms of separation of powers. Uh, you know, from the American perspective, no, no American president would ever go hat in hands of the Congress and say, can I please leave? You know, it would be, it would be, it would be in, in the minds of particularly the executive branch, you know, a capitulation to them. Uh, and from the American perspective, this, this concern about a separation of branches, which ironically is violated to, to, to show uh, that we have our uh, inconsistencies in our Constitution, when you're having the, the Congress pick the president in the failure of the Electoral College to achieve a majority, you're basically doing that. You're now allowing the president to be selected by the legislative branch. So we, we violated that sort of an internal contradiction within our own um, legislate within our own constitutional tradition okay just say that but you know of course our constitution establishes a bicameral legislature uh, with the house and senate and of course i think that i think one of the most interesting features of ours is again to go back to this 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 preoccupation within american political history of 
a concern for the forces of nationalism versus states' rights-oriented individuals. The Constitution bridges that gap by creating a legislature that is popularly, uh, excuse me, that allows large states to have you know, as many votes as they can get based on population in the House and the Senate tends to be based more upon equal representation. Like this, to a certain extent, there's this idea of the states sharing power among themselves trying to pacify those original concerns that the large states have with the small states, and at the same time achieving some sort of national consensus and to create a, co a cohesive national government. Okay, in, in Costa Rica, how is the legislative branch uh, structured? We have a unicameral uh, legislature, so just one, one chamber. Uh, the chamber is established by a proportional vote of, uh, of voters according to provinces. We have seven provinces. And uh, we have 57 uh, diputados or uh, members of Congress. Of those 57 diputados, they, they, they are elected by province according to population. And they are elected for a period of four years. They cannot be re-elected successively. So, so after four years, they have to go out of office and uh, Usually we have about 10% of, of legislatures that repeat after the four years they're, they're, they're out. But 90% of legislatures are new in every, in, in every period of four years. I mean, do you think the, uh, having the unicameral system in Costa Rica is kind of reflective of the size of the country and as well as the concentration of the population in the central part of the country? Yes, maybe, maybe, maybe it reflects population. One of the things that we have uh, thought in the past maybe 30 years, but we have, haven't been able to have a consensus, is that provinces in Costa Rica don't make sense. Uh, actually, province is a kind of a, a geographical uh, limit that not, not even makes sense from a geographical uh, point of view. Actually, the country works with 81 cantons or, or counties. So actually, what we should go is probably to, to a system in which the diputados were elected by, or will be elected by, by counties. But we haven't been able to, to change the system because the system of election of, of, the, of the legislative assembly is by list, not by uh, electoral circumscription. So in a way it's very uh, easy for the political parties to try to maintain the system because the political party has much more power versus the counties if this electoral system that we have now is maintained. Well, we kind of offer off of our list here but uh, and not directly in the constitutions of either country. Well, what about political parties? Maybe you ought to explain just a little bit about the structure of political parties in Costa Rica. Well, political parties are, are mainly established nationally, uh, but the way in which elections are held is that they have to be they have to have an organization by province. So actually, we have we have the the parties with the national uh, organization and then an election, uh, an organization that goes down to provinces. And of course, to get the votes, you have to go down to the cantones and to the districts. So we go down to the district level. But the, the thing is, our system of lists uh, doesn't really encourage uh, the, the candidate to be, to be a candidate, to, to be a grassroots candidate. So, so our system is kind of skewed into the sense of less importance to the grassroots uh, uh, popularity of the candidate and more to the popularity of the candidate within the party. Do you still have the uh, the, uh, the car caravans and parades and the, the special homes and everything like that they did when I lived there? This has changed some. Actually, 30 years ago, uh, elections were kind of a public uh, feast and uh, the, especially the two main parties and at that time we had two dominant parties 
now the system has changed and we have one, one dominant party and, and three others that are kind of minority. But we used to have, uh, as it was saying, we used to have parades of cars with banners and we used to put in our houses uh, banners with identifying if I was going to vote for one party or the other. When there was, when there were, was the, the husband with going to vote for one party and the wife for another, uh, they, then they put the two, the two <laughs> banners there. But uh, in the last 15 years, this has changed a lot. Now elections are not really like the US elections that are, you, you don't notice there's an election if you go by the, by the street. Because we, we still have on Sundays, uh, the Sunday of elections, we still have some transportation of voters done by the parties. But uh, the feast and the type of uh, car parades uh, have diminished considerably. Yeah, it, uh, when I lived there <clears throat> for a month or so before an election, you had to be very careful if you stepped out into the street or the road or anything, because there may be, you know, 15 cars going by all with their with the banner of their party, <coughs> the color, party colors there. And at that time, each party would have a special honk that kind of reflected the number of syllables in their candidate's name, you know, that, 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 or something. So you'd hear them coming a long ways away and all of them using their their special honk, you know, for uh, for the uh, uh, to signify their candidate. So yeah, and they had, uh, when I was there. They had kada so won't you know like that, and uh, so uh, they identified themselves in a lot of ways with their parties and their candidates. Um, okay, right along with what you were saying uh, about. Uh, the issue of not the legislators not succeeding themselves. Uh, do we have anything about that or about the president succeeding himself in the U.S. Constitution? Yeah, it's funny. Once again, we're back to these distinctions of state power and federal power. There was a, a, a Supreme Court case in 1995 called, uh, I believe it was uh, Thornton, U.S. versus Thornton, I believe. I didn't the citation. It's the U.S. Supreme Court that dealt with the issue of term limits for members of Congress. And the Constitution, uh, according to the Supreme Court, prohibits the states from limiting term limits for members of Congress. That would require, under the existing Constitution, an amendment. Uh, the, the judges ruled in 95 that that is a, a prerogative that the states do not have, uh, that they cannot uh, impose those. They, can, they are free to impose those on state terms for state offices, be they state legislature, state government, whatever. Uh, but no, that would require a constitutional amendment. Uh, in terms, of course, the president, yeah, we have uh, uh, oh, 20th or 21st? John Blank. 22nd, sir. Thank you. 22nd. <laughs> we start to run to get in the head after a while. 22nd Amendment, uh, yeah, that limits uh, two term rule. And of course, it's kind of interesting, you know, George Washington established the two term rule. And then FDR you know, breaks that. Uh, it was a matter of a cultural consensus that no no one should seek more than two terms, but then we went ahead and codified it. So, yeah, 20 seconds. Uh, so that's the only thing that we have in that regard. I know in the case of Costa Rica, this has gotten very complicated sometimes in regards to the president and how uh, if he can succeed uh, at a, at, after skipping a term and so on. So how, how is that set up? Actually, the 1949 Constitution is, establishes that uh, a president can, can, can be president for a period of four years, and then he has to be out of office two periods, uh, has to be out of office eight years. Nevertheless, the, the Legislative Assembly approved the constitutional reform and established a pro prohibition for re-election of presidents. But uh, we established, again, a constitutional court that is similar, let's say, to the Supreme Court, but that deals only with constitutional issues. And the constitutional court ruled that the reform of the Constitution had procedural 
uh, defects. So now we went back to the four year and eight years out of office for the president. I think this next one is another, to me, kind of an interesting thing, a curiosity that a president, is this right, uh, of all that a president cannot be directly succeeded by a direct ancestor or descendant? No. That you can't, so it's true. You can't. This, I guess, relates back to a situation where you had two brothers that were uh, dominating the government, the Tinoco brothers, you know, back in the early part of the 20th century. We don't have anything like that in our Constitution. It's never, it's, I think mainly because there's never been an issue. Uh, well, some people say it has, <laughs> others might disagree. I know that we've had, I believe it's, uh, and this may have to be updated now, but I believe it's something to the effect that 10 U.S. presidents have come out of five families. Uh, when you add up the connections, uh, something to that effect. And of course, we have had two father and sons no, but they didn't actually, well, they didn't actually succeed each other, but you know, they did. this idea of, it's an old American fear of the creation of a hereditary monarchy, yeah, but you know, we don't have anything codified to prevent that. Now, uh, Dr. Carvajal, I know that Costa Rica has two vice presidents. Can you explain the, the, the reasoning and such on this? The, the Constitution establishes that the, we elect a formula in which there is a, a, the candidate for president and two vice presidents. And actually, the two vice presidents were based on the idea that uh, uh, the, the, the Constitutional Assembly didn't want the vice president to have a lot of power. So having two power was kind of a distributed. The other, the other thing is that the Constitution doesn't establish any uh, obligations for the Vice Presidents. The Vice Presidents can work with the President, uh, can be a public official, but they could also not work uh, within the public uh, uh, executive power if the intent is decided so. Uh, actually, until about this, the early 70s, Vice presidents usually wouldn't have not even an office uh, in the in the uh, presidential uh, uh, power, in the, in the executive branch. After the end, eight, the end of the 70s, now it's you, it's the custom that the two vice presidents will have an office, but it's a small office. Uh, it will not have a big uh, uh, army of bureaucrats just maybe a secretary or something like that. And because of that, in the 90s and up to today, what has been happening is that vice presidents usually act also as ministers. The Constitution establishes that the vice president can be a minister. So... That would be uh, like a cabinet member. Yeah, uh, a cabinet member. So, so today, usually, the vice president will be also the head of a cabinet office. Does one have more authority than the other, or just a priority in succession or what? Yeah, well, the, the, we have a first vice president and a second vice, vice president. The, if the president dies, the first vice president will take office. Uh, the second is, is would only would take office if the first president dies. The other thing is that when the president leaves the country, he can appoint any of the two to 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 be in his place. So so sometimes it has happened in the past that the uh, president gets into a kind of a difference of opinion with one of the vice presidents, so he would not appoint him. He appoints him <laughs> the, uh, only the other. <laughs> okay, uh, Dr. Mason, what does the U.S. Constitution do you does it give to the vice president? Uh, well, of course, it, it, in, a, in a way, it almost sounds like uh, the initial way we uh, treated the vice president was sort of similar, uh, in a way, to what you were describing initially, that under the original Constitution, the vice president was the runner-up to the president. Uh, and then, of course, in 1804, we passed the 12th Amendment, which modifies the way in which we elect the president and was designed to uh, ameliorate the problems of the election of 1800 some of the problems that we had with, once we had parties and you know, 
all these types of things, but essentially the vice president, uh, much to my chagrin, and I keep arguing this point in vain, uh, you've heard me say this many times, I think we waste the best people uh, with our vice presidency. I think we should, uh, I think there's a role for the pre vice president to have a greater role, but of course, constitutionally, the vice president really, his only job is uh, to essentially, as I say, perform a death watch. He also, uh, that's what people say, <laughs> He's a stand-in guy, but the vice president actually does, actually has other responsibilities. For example, uh, the vice president uh, oversees the returns of the Electoral College and announces the winner in the Senate with the clerk of the Senate. Now, nobody cares about that because at that point, everybody knows he's gonna be the next president, but it is his job, his or her job to do that. Uh, I've always said it's kind of, uh, you said about the, the vice president being a minister. Sometimes citizens, uh, states, People who study the presidency will describe the vice president as a minister without a portfolio. You know, he's, he's this really great sounding job. I've always said it'd be a great job. I'd love to be vice president of the United States. I think it'd be fantastic. Uh, you say, All right, nothing to do. Nothing to do, you just run around, just, you just end up called the chief mourner for the president. You just walk around saying, I'm so sorry. You go to funerals and you represent the president and you, you just, that's about all you do, but, but there's great perks. Uh, I know one of the things that, it's not the Constitution, but it's, it's legislatively speaking, it's statutory. The vice president is automatically uh, the chairman of certain boards, like uh, he's automatically on the uh, board of the Smithsonian, which is run by Congress, of course. And he has certain responsibilities like that, which I would love to be on the board of the Smithsonian. I could spend the whole day there just fooling around in the exhibits, closing it off in my style. I always tell classes that all the vice president has to do is set his office and look down the hallway and think, I wish that guy would die so I'd have something to do. That's about it, yeah. About it. There's a, there was a great uh, yeah. musical Broadway in the 19, uh, musical Broadway play in the 1930s or 40s, and it was called Of The I Sing, name of the play. And in the play, uh, students of the presidency sometimes use this term. The name of the vice president in the play, it was, the whole play was about this vice president who has nothing to do. And his name was Throttlebottom. <laughs> vice President Throttlebottom. And all he would do is go to the park and he would feed the pigeons and he would talk to the children that were there. And then he'd go back to the White House and he would say, Mr. President, is there anything I can do? And he'd say, you're doing a great job. Keep it up. Go back out to the park and play with the kids. And so his entire day, he, he had what was called the throttle bottom complex, which is that he's got all these great ideas, but nobody wants to listen to him. And so, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I think we waste some good people and waste some of their talents. I, I'd say, you know, some of the good things, we've had some activist vice presidents in the past. I think, I think, I think Vice President Gore did some good things with the NPR, with the, uh, uh, the National Performance Review. There was, some, there was some, I think, bipartisan agreement on some good things that he did to not only reinvigorate the office of vice president, but you know some cost-saving measures uh, under the Clinton administration. There were some good things that were done at that time. So the answer is, of course, the Constitution limits the vice president's potential, but kind of like you said, that he can be involved to the extent that the president wants him to be involved. So I think it sounds like there's some similarities between our two systems in that regard. Okay, how about this, uh, Dr. Mason? What does the uh, Constitution say about trial by jury? Sixth Amendment, I believe, uh, requires trial by jury. Yeah. Uh, and of course, uh, th this is also getting into that interesting issue of, uh, excuse me, of uh, incorporation and, and how does that apply to the states. Uh, initially, it was meant only to apply to the uh, uh, to the federal level, and now you know, also to the state. So once again, you get this issue of that's actually mentioned specifically in the Constitution. How about in Costa Rica? In, in Costa Rica, we don't have trial by, by jury uh, at all. The, what we have is a system in which we, the judicial power is established with uh, magistrates at the top and then judges that will judge all cases up to the, the, the misdemeanors. Uh, I thought I'd make a couple of comments on that. There's a couple of things. One is, in the United States, it says a jury of peers. Okay, in Costa Rica, which, due to the Spanish background, was uh, definitely more of a, even though it's a middle class country, it's more of a, uh, uh, of a class system. So it brings into question what a jury of peers would be in Costa Rica and make 
thinks it may be more reasonable to uh, not go to trial, trial by jury. And I think I had one other comment, and I don't remember what it was now. So anyway, well, we'll I'll, I'll just to piggyback on, I don't know if this is what you were going to say, but sometimes you and I think okay. on the same way, we've been accused of that. <laughs> it may be more, I think I think you're right on the culture of that, that was more of an American, more of an egalitarian idea that you could be judged on the black like, better on the frontier by your peers because everybody was pretty much in the same boat. You had elites, of course, in the community, but it, oftentimes you were all pretty much the same. I don't know if that was where you were going. No, I know the other thing I was going for with our tradition coming from English common law, yeah. uh, which goes clear back to uh, the Germanic uh, uh, groups that came into Europe, the, uh, the idea of a jury trial is, goes way back in tradition, whereas tradition of Spanish and Roman law uh, that was not part of that tradition, and so as it comes down to Costa Rica as a form of Spanish colony, it's, uh, there was no precedent for something like that really in their, in their background, in their cultural background. Okay, we want to try to get this wrapped up here in a minute. Um, okay, very quickly, uh, Dr. Mason, how are Supreme Court justices selected in the United States? Uh, Very difficult, with a lot of difficulty, I know. Yeah, and, and that, that process has to a certain extent been influenced by, by politics now in a way that it used to not be to the same extent with the advent of, uh, of the uh, 17th Amendment with the direct popular election of U.S. Senators. I think that has changed the dynamic. But of course, it involves uh, having the president select judges and then being confirmed to the Senate. And of course, I was referring to that idea that prior to the Senate being so popularly influenced by direct election, it was more of a, a closed uh, uh, event. In fact, I believe prior to, to the 19, or the 1880s, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe prior to the 1880s, all of the uh, Senate hearings were pretty much closed to the public. They just weren't considered public. Um, they, weren't, they weren't considered something that was uh, amenable for public discussion or consumption since the people weren't voting on the senators. Uh, but that has changed now. I think I think that has, to a certain degree, made it more problematic for the president and the Senate to reach these conclusions on nominees. But nonetheless, that is how it's done. So we have uh, judges who, the Constitution does not say for life. It says during good tenure, during good behavior, they maintain their tenure. It's not say for life, but that's the practical effect, and it's pretty hard to remove a sitting judge. All that can be done has been done. What, what about the Supreme Court justices in Costa Rica? In, in Costa Rica, Supreme Court justices that uh, head the, 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 the main uh, tribunals that are of the highest level in the court are elected by the, by the uh, legislative assembly for a period of eight years. Actually, actually the executive power has nothing to do with it this election. And uh, for, for the first election, it, it has to be elected by a two-thirds majority of the House. So that, that, that means that it's, it, they have to reach consensus of several part, political parties. After they are elected, then when they come for re-election every eight years, uh, in order for them to be elected, they only need one-third. So actually, if, if a magistrate has two-thirds of votes against him, then he would not be elected. The tradition is that they are elected uh, more or less for life. If, if you don't mind, Aaron, I have, I have two more things here that I'd like to, that are mainly related to the Costa Rica right. Constitution. I'd like to kind of skip over the top of you for a minute here. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> The first one is uh, the U.S. Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and other parts of the Constitution deal directly with what the limitations of government power is in relation to individuals. Now, in the Costa Rican Constitution, there are other rights that are enumerated in the Constitution that are more social rights, uh, things to do with the right to, uh, to public education, things like that. You want to comment on those just a minute, Marty? 
Yes, the, the having the Constitution of Costa Rica approved in 1949 actually was after the, a lot of social reforms that uh, were made in, in the world actually in the 40s, uh, like establishing the labor codes, like establishing an eight hour as a maximum workload for a day, etc. So some of these social rights are in the Constitution. I'll give you some, some examples. Uh, it, it was established in the 1949 Constitution that a uh, national system of health would have to be established by, by the Legislative Assembly. And uh, it was established that uh, uh, an autonomous institution which we call in Spanish Caja Costalicense del Seguro Social, which means social security uh, fund for uh, health, uh, was established in the 1949 Constitution. Actually, uh, universal health insurance came to be until the 70s. It began slowly, little by little, but, to, but in the 70s, in the end of the 70s, we, we got the system of health insurance established uh, as one of those social rights to be universal. So today, all Costa Ricans are covered by, by health insurance uh, from birth to grave. The other uh, interesting thing that the Constitution establishes is that uh, a minimum wage has to be established by a uh, board Establishing the Constitution, but that has to be approved by the Legislative Assembly in its mechanics. And actually, we have since the 50s uh, a national wage board comprised of, of, the, of three parties, the, the entrepreneurs, the, the laborers, and uh, the public sector. And, uh, and uh, minimum wages are established normally once a year, but since uh, we have had the high inflation twice a year. And then there's, there's, there's a curiosity that uh, we have in the Constitution the, the right for citizens to uh, uh, ecology and to uh, the protection of the environment. So any citizen is entitled if uh, the ecology is being damaged to establish the, an appeal uh, to the public institution if it's responsible or even to the public institution for it to enforce the protection of the environment if a uh, private party is the one dam damaging the environment. Would you want to comment just a minute about the autonomous institutions in general? It's kind of a curious thing in Costa Rica that most places don't have and the reasons why the autonomous institutions were originally, uh, uh, originally created. Okay, the, this, this topic I could talk for half an hour, but I tried That's to the reason I said briefly. I tried to <laughs> be brief. Actually, autonomous institutions are in a way similar to the TVA, to the Tennessee Valley Authority in the US. Uh, they were established as the TVA mainly to do a job that was a technical job and not a political job. So, so in the 1949 Constitution, we established the, the possibility that the, that the Legislative Assembly approves uh, autonomous institutions by a two-third two majority. And we have lots of uh, autonomous institutions, actually more than we should, but we have uh, four, four public banks. Uh, we have the National Health, Health Insurance Organization, uh, we have uh, an autonomous institution that deals with tourism uh, and uh, one that deals with the, the production of electricity. One that this same one then acquired the monopoly of telecommunications that we are eliminating uh, since there are negotiations of the CAFTA, of the Central American Free Trade Agreement with the U.S. And actually. At the beginning, in the 50s, the role of the autonomous institution was really important because it had to do with development of uh, infrastructure, development of, of uh, 
roads, development of ports, uh, of electricity, of uh, telephones. But all of them are set as public monopolies. So now we are in the process of revising uh, at least some of the public monopolies. We've opened up the competition, telecommunications, which uh, would mean cellular phones and internet uh, competition. We eliminated the monopoly for also open to competition of uh, insurance up, up, up until actually today, uh, no, until next year, uh, until last year, insurance in Costa Rica was a public monopoly of the government. Now, competition is beginning. And uh, so I would say that they were really important, but that now we are in the process of, of trying to eliminate and open to competition uh, certain of those areas. Uh, one of the most important that we opened to competition was banking. Banking was a, a public monopoly for, from, the, from, the, from the 1949 Constitution to the 1980s. And now we have a banking system in which more or less half of the banks are public. In, in size of uh, business and half of the, uh, of, the, of the banks are private. I'm, excuse me, basically to the end of my list, either one of you have any other comments you'd like to make about uh, the things we've been talking about? Does, does anybody out there have any questions about any of the things we've talked about? Yes, sir. I don't know how you have to be to get one of those ID cards. I mean, or when they give to you? Okay, uh, that's interesting. Until recently, maybe five years ago or ten years ago, uh, when you got to be 18, actually, actually, three months after, uh, before you you are going to be 18 years old, you you go and apply for it to the to the national uh, tribunal of the national electoral tribunal. Actually, it's a really efficient system, which you go there, maybe you wait for half an hour, and you know, picture is taken. The only thing is that don't, they don't give it to you the same day. They they, they didn't give it to you the same day on, up until about three years ago. Uh, now, in the last ten years, uh, identity card similar to the one I have will be will give even to students when they are in high school. So they will know the number that they will have in their identity card since they are in, 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 in let's say, in seventh grade. So they have this that is not valid, of course, as a legal document and, uh, because they are not, they are not, have not reached the majority age. And actually, now the system of the electoral tribunal has decentralized so you don't have to go all the way to San Jose, which is the way you do it in the, in the past. And you can get your, your, your identity card in, in, in many places of the country. I'm trying to remember if I ever waited for less than 30 minutes for anything in Costa Rica. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been the only one. <laughs> uh, something else that I don't think was brought up. It, it's, you could make an argument that the identity card is similar to the social security card. I mean, you know, we don't like to think we got identity cards, but, you know, when I was a kid, you got your social security card and you got ready to get a job. And then somewhere along the line, they started giving them to their babies, and it never changes. Uh -huh. and, and, and sometimes, uh, one time I went to run an apartment, they wouldn't rent it to me if I showed them my social security card, which, you know, I thought was kind of ridiculous, but, uh, you know, other places that wouldn't be the case. But sometimes you have a job open and tell that you have to put your social security number down. And I, that's just a comment. Uh, that's why I asked if you got one when you were born, for example. Mm -hmm. you don't, you don't get a computer. Okay, when did you drive? And do you have a driver's license that's separate from your identity card? We have a driver's license that is separate, but we, we get both documents when you're 18. 18. Because we, 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 we cannot drive before 18. But there are some who might question even after 18, but... <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. Here's my hand. Uh, yeah, I had a question on uh, governance of local areas. Uh, from my understanding, there are no governors in provinces, and there's no mayors in the cities. Are there county districts, and is that included in the Constitution? 
Yes, uh, the constitution establishes uh, the what is called the municipal regime, and actually we have 81 counties. The 81 counties have 81 municipalities. We have a municipality by county, and uh, the county has a mayor. The that until maybe 10 years ago, the mayor would be appointed by the, by the municipal uh, board that is elected, the municipal board. Uh, recently, we, we, we made a, 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 a reform of the constitution and, and mayors uh, are elected directly in a different, in a different uh, election than the, than the election for president and, and, and deputados. So, so actually, the, the, the each county will have a municipal government with a mayor, both of them public, publicly elected. And the mayor uh, does not only have executive power, he has some judicial powers too, right? Not really, no. Not as much now. But used to be then. Yeah. Uh, but the other thing is that the, the province has a governor, but it, has by, by now no duties. So it, it used to be a kind of a political uh, position that uh, one, the president would give to persons that had aided him in the political campaign. But, but provinces now don't, don't really have any function. There's no local laws at all, right? Local laws? Uh, no, actually the, the, the ordinances for, for, for the uh, counties are most mostly uh, approved by the legislative assembly. The municipal governments can issue, uh, let's say, ordinance for uh, garbage recollection, and, and they could, and they're beginning to have a local police. But until recently, there were there were no local police, just just the national police. So if you want to change the speed limit, you have to get the federal government to do it. Yeah. But, but you are talking about a country that's, you know, the three of them would fit in. But even so. But yeah. That, yeah, I agree. I agree with you completely. Yeah. I like what we're doing. Okay, any other questions? Did somebody else have one over there? I thought somebody, okay. okay. Um, you, you mentioned that uh, the Supreme Court has not English. And, and, and another, another comment, yeah, no, what, what I mentioned is that Spanish is the, the official language of the country, but English is the second language, but the other thing is that the government and in this system of public education have, have, has, has been increasing the number of years in which English was taught, in, especially in high school. Because the, the idea in Costa Rica is that English as the dominant second language is really important. What about legal documents? Are they only in Spanish? Legal documents are in Spanish, but you can have them translated, but they're only in Spanish. Yes. I have a question. Uh, um, you I'm not sure I have a perfect answer. I, I think, here's just something off the top of my head. I, I think it probably was largely due to the fact that the founders were, I think they felt like that would probably be unimportant because the majority of them came from an English-speaking Anglo background. And they, I don't think they felt like it was a, an issue. Now, certainly you had enclaves, even at that point, uh, of non non English speaking people. In fact, one of my favorite stories in this regard deals with uh, Frederick Muhlenberg, who by his very name you know he's not an Anglophile. <laughs> Frederick Muhlenberg, who spoke German himself uh, and actually was educated in, uh, at a German university. He was American. I believe he's American born, but he had ties in Germany. He was the first speaker of the House 
1789. And Frederick Muhlenberg was asked a question by his constituents, who mainly were German speaking. And he was asked the question, this was in the first session of uh, Congress in 1789, when he was asked, uh, would you please translate the laws of the United States into German so that we, your constituents, can read them? His answer was, the sooner the Germans learn to speak English, the sooner they will become American. Uh, that was from a founding father, Frederick Muhlenberg. So I think that was perhaps the, the, you know, the driving force behind that. Uh, America was at that time predominantly English speaking. Do you have any other questions or comments? Question back there somewhere. Okay, there. Um, what are some of the influences of the Costa Rican government were upon this matter? We see a lot of influences from the Enlightenment period by the Catholic Fathers. Uh, what are some of the ones that you got to so I, I didn't hear you quite well. Yeah, you know, just, as, just as the U.S. Constitution is influenced by the Enlightenment, I would say it has the influence of the Enlightenment in, in, in most of the Constitution, but also it has the influence, let's say, of the social reform uh, of the 40s. And some other things that are kind of local, like uh, uh, that have to do with social uh, democrat ideas of the time, like the autonomous institutions, and some problems that we have had, like the fraud system, the fraud in the elections, and that, that is why we established the, the tribunal to head elections. Actually, a uh, curiosity over the tribunal. The tribunal, not even the Supreme Court can intervene in the, in the affairs of elections. The, the tribunal is the one that counts the votes, establishes the elections and 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 this and decides who is the winner and the other thing is that six months before elections the tribunal is the the authority over the police force not the not the executive uh, branch Did that answer your question okay yeah it comes out of an era of social democracy no doubt <coughs> okay, uh, any other questions? Anybody? Or if not, I I don't know, it was interesting to me. I thought it was a good job. Let's give them a round of applause.